Okay, so let's talk about emotions. Now, emotions are an interesting topic in relationship to motivation because they're often talked about together. You'll see chapters in intro textbooks called Emotions and Motivation. There are even uh, whole courses on emotions that really are emotions and motivation. So emotions are these subjective uh, feelings that we get um, and they affect many parts of our thought process. They affect our behavior. They produce um, facial expressions. We get emotions that change our physiology. Our heart races when we're scared. Our heart races when we're falling in love. These strong emotions. Um, but they also influence our behaviors and, of course, influence how our behaviors are put into action, right? How we um, are motivated to do things are very influenced by our emotions. Now, there are a lot of theories about emotions and they've been changing. Theories go back 140 years and each year there seems to be some new theories about this subjective state or this physiological state. I'd like to spend this lecture going through some of those theories um, and some evidence for them and some different ways of thinking about them. And we'll end this lecture talking about long-term emotions um, that last a long time, which are moods. So sometimes people can say emotions happen quickly and are over relatively quickly, but moods are changes in emotional states that happen, um, that, that maintain for a long time. Now, psychologists will often use the word affect to discuss our feelings or subjective experience of emotions. Um, uh, the blanket term affect disorder is a psychological disorders that are associated with changes in moods and emotions that can be sometimes very aversive. Um, major depressive disorder is considered an affect disorder. So emotions, let's, let's just take happiness and joy, right? We, we've, uh, we've experienced those emotions and they're associated with, with smiling and, ha and, and changes in our physiology. We can really look at these kinds of emotions sometimes and say, oh, okay, I see somebody, they have these facial expressions, even animals, you're like, oh, I think they're in a good state. I think they're in a good emotional state. Now we can go back and forth on this. Again, we're gonna talk about different theories, but um, sometimes emotions are categorized uh, and there are considered by some to be seven basic emotions, happiness, love, surprise, sadness, fear, anger, disgust. And again, these are some theories that each of these general states of emotion are accompanied by very specific physiological states or motivational states. Another way of looking at it is what's called uh, Pluchik's wheel of emotion. Again, lots of theories. And Pluchik thought there were eight primary emotions. And emotions change in intensity. When we change the intensity of an emotion, we can give them different descriptive names. We'll look at that in a second. And as different emotions on this wheel uh, blend together, we create new categories or new ways of describing emotions. So this is Pluchik's very famous wheel of emotions. And if we look at some of these things, let's go and take a look at joy, right? So joy is on the inner, in, the, in this middle ring. And if it's less intense, we lighten the color in his wheel and we have serenity. But if we increase the intensity, oftentimes increasing the thoughts of arousal, we get ecstasy. And you can navigate this. Fear, well, apprehension is, is kind of a fear, but it's not as intense. Terror is a more intense fear. But then Pluchik said, okay, we can combine these. For example, if we combine joy and trust or serenity and acceptance, we get an emotional state of love, right? Or if we get um, anticipation and anger, we get aggressiveness, right? So this is just a way of categorizing. Psychologists, biologists, we love to categorize things. And this is a way of understanding relationships of emotions. We'll see later on that categorizing emotions doesn't always work um, for theories of emotional states. So let's look at some theories of emotions. Well, we always come back to genetics. We always come back to evolution. 
the the influence and we think about emotions in terms of well why do we have these emotions why does it help us during our long evolution our mammalian evolution how are emotions the subjective state the physiological arousal the expression how are these adaptive how do they help survive how do they help an individual reproduce how keep from fighting all those things so we have emotional states towards food. I don't know about you, but when I eat buttered popcorn with M&Ms at the movies, um, that's, a, that's a really positive emotional state. But we also have emotional states that bond us to our children, bond us to our mates. Again, evolutionarily important. Fear and predators. We've talked about fear as an emotional state and how important it is. Fear helps us survive. Fear, fear helps us remember where to go and where not to go. You know, sadness leads to crying, but it also leads to help. We feel sad. We have the emotional states of, fat, of sadness, and those around us come and comfort us and help us. Um, external cues for emotion might reduce conflict. So if animals have a way of understanding others' emotional states, it might reduce actual physical aggression, right? Darwin, one of his uh, one of his later books that he wrote was on the universality of emotions. We'll talk about that in a second. He said these are innate things because we see emotional states, physical states, facial expressions, body postures, very similar across all cultures in the world. So he said, oh, em emotional states must be genetic, must be innate. So let's look at an example. And this was actually, this is a picture from Darwin's book. So you see this animal right here, or another animal. See, what do you think? You go up and pet that animal, rub him in the belly? No. That animal is giving indications of aggressive or uh, emotional states. This is a submissive, right? These animals communicate with one another. So here's a video of two wolves communicating with each other, not fighting, not hurting each other, but establishing dominance. So the one closest to us is showing submissive, still showing teeth, like don't mess with me, but I'm not in the mood for fighting. If you look at the tail, the tail is brought underneath the dog or the wolf, and so this is submissive state. This one is the dominant, the alpha male. Ears are forward, right? higher posture, those kinds of things, facial expressions for communications of emotional states. One of the most interesting studies of this are, uh, are two animals from different, that are different species, both carnivores, both highly aggressive, um, but they can communicate to each other. So here's a polar bear and here's a husky dog. And the polar bear and the husky dog, the polar bear might kill the husky, but the polar bear comes, shows signs that it's not in for fighting or, or for aggression, but wants to play. The dog does the same. They communicate to each other and they play. Play is a very important emotional state that both animals want to experience. Okay. So here's a picture of this happening, right? This happens all the time. These two animals communicate to each other their emotional states. I don't want to fight. I don't want to kill. I want to play. This is not a domesticated polar bear. Two this is natural, natural predators bear. in empathy. How is it that Brian's dogs and these bears seem to have reached such a remarkable understanding? I can't say I know all the answers. I just know that when there's a bad relationship, the other dogs know it and we move it out. But if the relationships are casual and they're, they're very exploratory, the bears are social, very individualistic, but they have a, a social adaptability. Okay. So these animals need that emotional state, need that joy, need that play, and they communicate to each other. Okay. So let's go over some, what is known as the classical theory of emotion. Uh, and there's some characteristics of this, and there's some different theories within the classical theory of emotion that we should probably talk about. So here's some components to what's known as the classical theory. We're going to juxtapose the classical theory with more contemporary theories. So one thing, each emotion produces distinctive 
subjective experiences, each mo emotions. And this is primarily the seven or the eight of emotions, right? But they also have facial expressions that are unique and body language and physiological changes. When I mean physiological changes, I'm talking about heart rate changes or, or skin conductance changes or other things in our, that change in our physiology. This term is often used that each emotion has a fing physiological fingerprint, right? A characteristic. You can say, oh, okay, we have this facial expression, we have this body change, we have this heart rate change. They are experiencing fear, okay? This goes back to the most famous person in emotional research, and that's Paul Ekman. And he found that, and he really worked a lot with facial expressions, especially micro expressions, even, even the slightest change twitch in facial muscles could be mapped in a way to specific emotions. A facial expression of one type, okay, they are happy, they are sad, they are fearful, they are uh, angry, they are disgusted right? These are sort of fingerprints, facial fingerprints of different emotions. And he found that he could take pictures of emotions, people experiencing emotions, extreme smiling or extreme anger. And he could show these images all over the world. No matter what culture you go to, people go, okay, that person's happy and that person's sad and that person is uh, fearful, right? So that's Going, he's very much in line with Darwin's theories of emotions. That they're, they're innate, they're universal, right? So we get what's called the universality of emotions. Emotions, and this is how the theory goes. Emotions, the categories of emotions, are genetic, genetically determined, or innate, born with. They are very similar across cultures, and all people have the potential to experience the same emotions. So if you're in a tribe in New G Papua New Guinea, they experience happiness, sadness, fear, disgust, love, just like we do, right? Emotions are not something that we come without information and we learn emotions, but emotions, we, we are born with them, okay? So he was really into facial expressions, as I said, identifying, people could identify what um, expressions, what, what emotions these were feeling. And this is not only in humans, but in animals. Okay, so if you look at cats, you can tell that this cat is sad and this cat is sleepy. And okay, that's a bit of a joke because you can't see emotions in, in cats, but you actually can. And there's been a lot of research on the physiology, the neurology of expressions in cats. For example, that cat right there with this expression, you're not going to get close to that. That's a very angry cat. And this is a very curious cat, right? So, um, especially on research with aggression, facial expressions in cats have been used a lot in research. So, we have kind of similar facial expressions to other primates. Right? So I bet you could probably guess which one of these is fearful, right? Which one is angry? Which one is, is a, a little happier? Because we, we share these. That's another thing that Ekman said and Darwin said is other primates show the same or similar facial expressions that we do to communicate these ideas. That's the universality. Let's look at these relationships between physiology and emotions, physiological arousal. One experiences subjective or cognitive emotions, and, and they also experiences physiological responses uh, to that emotion. We, we, we've all seen this. You know, if, you, if you're about to uh, ride a big roller coaster and you're very scared, your heart is going to be pounding through your chest and you're going to be experiencing all this. Your hands are going to get clammy and your teeth are going to grit. All those physiology that correlates with the emotions. And this is what a lot of classical theory uh, in emotions, these are what the research are trying to understand, that relationship. So one possibility, one relationship 
is that you see something fearful, you're out walking along and you run into a tiger. I'm not going to say that happens often, but let's say it does. Your mind, now one possibility is that you see it. Your mind says, that is something to be fearful of. I'm going to now get my body ready to deal with this physical, this, this, this stimulus, this scary stimulus. So because I think that I'm scared, my body's going to go, okay, uh, let me help you out. I'm going to race your heart because you might have to run away, right? I'm going to do all these physiological changes, sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight. That's possible. But another possibility is that the brain is interpreting the reaction. So you see this thing that's very scary and your amygdala, part of your brain, amygdala goes, oh, that I know that. That's something very scary, right? And the amygdala is unconscious, right? It's not part of your conscious cognitive thought process. Maybe that's the cortex. But your amygdala recognizes it and sends a quick uh, um, signal to your heart to race your heart and to release adrenaline and to release cortisol and to do all these things because you're about to fight a tiger. And your brain then says, hmm, okay, your heart is really racing. I've, I've seen this before. Here's, I'm seeing the physiological fingerprints of what should be fear. So I'm going to go ahead and have that subjective sense of fear. So the physiology become, comes before the subjective sense. The subjective sense of fear is an interpretation of what the body's already doing to prepare to deal with this event. So, which one is it? Is it the thought first, then the physiology, or is it the physiology, then the thought, or what? This is where the theories come. And I'd like you to know a few of these theories. They're in every textbook. You should know. So the first one is the James Lane theory. Remember William James? He's a... Uh, considered the father of modern day psychology, wrote lots of books. And then there's Carl Lang, and they kind of came up with this theory together. And what they said was that each emotion has a very specific physiological response. F fear and love are going to have different physiological responses according to this theory. I'm not saying this theory is right. I'm saying this is the theory. And your body interprets the physiological response. Oh, your face is doing this. Your muscle above your eyes are doing this. Your muscles along your jaw are doing this. And your hair is sticking up on a bit. And your eyes are dilated. And your heart is racing. And your I know what that is. Those are the physiology of fear. So... That's what I'm going to feel. The subjective sense comes after the physiology. Emotions occur when we become aware of the body's physiological arousal. Awareness of the pounding heart. So, you see the tiger, and you your body reacts. Well, what am I going to need to do to fight this tiger, or to run away from this tiger, or to freeze, or whatever... And whatever these physiology and facial expressions and muscle activity that's going on, your brain goes, oh, I know that. That's fear. And I'm going to have the affective experience, the subjective experience of that fear. That's the James Lang theory. First the physiology, then the subjective sense of the emotion. So the James Lang theory has a bit of a mixed bag when it comes to uh, support for this theory. So how do we how do we test it? Well, we manipulate it. Uh, put them in situations that elicit emotional responses, direct facial actions, change the facial expressions, uh, see if that changes the emotional state. Uh, ask subjects to relive an emotional experience from their past, check their physiology. Um, emotions should have very different physiological responses. So, fear and disgust and anger and love and happiness and joy should all have these characteristic physiologies. That's the basic idea. And I do this kind of research in my lab a little bit. Um, I have a psychophysiology lab, and here is one of my students. 
and we put these electrodes on the forehead. This is, these are called the corrugator muscles. And we put some electrodes on the cheek. These are called the zygomaticus um, muscles. What do you think person is feeling when these muscles are activated? What does this correlate with? Think, do it yourself. Make those muscles tense. Well, if these muscles are active, we see a correlation with negative emotions, disgust and anger and, and even fear. And if these are active, then we're getting a little bit of twitch in the, in the cheek, which is smiling. So if these muscles are more active, people, we can say, oh, they have a subjective positive affect. They have a positive thing. We put some electrodes on the fingers. These uh, amplify even the slightest sweat, which tells us a little bit about arousal states. Um, and you can't really feel it, but every time something is distracting or fearful or whatever, you're going to get tiny, tiny little bits of sweat on your fingers and, and these amplify it. And we can record it. You can see here that there are electrodes probably right about here. And then electrodes were also put on her side and we get heart rate and we can look at heart rate. Does it go up? Does it go down? And heart rate variability. What's how, how consistent are the beats? Those have been correlated with different emotional states. So here's some research that James, <coughs> that support James Lang. You induce emotional states in people in a psychophysiology lab and you tend to see anger elevates heart rate, um, but happiness doesn't. Uh, happiness elevates EDR electrodermal response. That's this right here, electrodermal response. Um, uh, but anger doesn't. Okay, so we're getting a little bit of fingerprints for emotional states. I will tell you, I've worked in the psychophysiology lab for several years, and I find it difficult uh, to get physiological markers for uh, lots of different types of emotions. Um, what I'm about, what I can do, and what other people tend to be able to do, is measure physiology, arouse that physiology to a good state, right? Get the get it up there, and then maybe able to say, ah, good, bad. We call that valence, valence of emotions, good, bad, a good emotion. They're feeling a good valence, a good valence of emotions, or bad. Eh, they don't really like this. They they don't feel very good and not really physiological markers for all the complexity of emotions. Often, emotional responses produce very similar physiology, physiological responses. Let me give you an example. You're walking to your car, it's very late at night, and you hear somebody walking behind you in the dark. Your heart races, right? Your heart races. Skin gets a little clammy. You're scared, right? You might feel fear. Um, Oh, what about if you walk and you're walking across campus and you walk into that person that you've, you have an attraction to and you two are just starting a romance and you're falling in love and you see them across the quad and you walk up to them, your heart is racing, your hands are clammy. That's a very different subjective emotional state between I'm about to be, you know, murdered by this person walking behind me and oh I'm falling in love with this person these are very similar physiologies and so it, it can be kind of different autonomic responses tend to be rather general autonomic which is skin response heart rate um, eyes dilation all those kinds of things uh, they they aren't as exact as we like them to be um, happiness often produces autonomic response. Uh, very happiness often produces little autonomic responses, and this is this is true. We'll talk about this in a bit. What if you're content? You're you're sitting on the beach, and you're done with finals, and you got to go to the beach, and you you got your favorite drink, and you're sitting in your chair, and the waves are coming in, and you feel just about as happy as you've felt in a long time. Are you producing a lot of physiological responses? Is your face moving much? Are you smiling ear to ear? No, you're probably sitting back in your chair, very calm, not a lot of physiology, not a lot of facial expressions, and yet you're about as happy as you've been in a long time. So we can, physiology, in terms of physiology, fear is a good one, aggression, embarrassment, embarrassment's a good one, but 
happiness and joy is not an easy thing to discriminate physiologically. Here's another experiment. Um, yeah, a little bit of support, maybe. Um, so the idea of James and Lang theory is your emotions are an interpretation of what your body is doing. It's interpreting your heart. It's interpreting your skin. It's interpreting. So what happens when you can't? Because there's a spinal cord injury and it's not getting these feedbacks, right? We call this somatic feedbacks. We're not getting it. The spinal cord has been severed. How does that affect emotions? So subjects uh, who suffered spinal cord injuries were asked to mentally relive emotional events that took place before or after an injury. And what uh, Berman found was, well, they're not, uh, after the injury, they say that I emotional states uh, lack the same arousal, uh, uh, sense of arousal, sense of heat, sense of passion um, after the injury, which... In other words, how it was interpreted was, hey, if you're not getting the feedback from the body, you're not going to experience the same intensity of the emotion. Kind of a James Lang support. Um, this is this study found a little bit is a little bit weak too. Okay, let's go through another theory. This is called the James Bard theory, and it's also it also has a physiological component. But he, uh, Cannon Baird, really disagreed with James Lang. We have physiological arousal without subjective feelings of emotions. For example, exercising, your heart is racing, but are you feeling fear? Are you feeling uh, uh, incredible joy, a sexual arousal, any of that? No, your heart's racing. Your brain is interpreting, oh, your heart's racing. I'm, not st I'm still not going to feel these emotions. What Ken Bart also said is we can have a subjective feeling before we have a physiological arousal. Why, we can be scared before our heart starts racing. I mean, you're not, I mean, it takes a second or two for all that signaling together in the heart, heart to start racing. During that second, you're not feeling anything, you're waiting. No, Cannon Bard said, no, you can, you can have a subjective sense of an emotion state even before the emotion kicks in, the physiology kicks in. So the Cannon Bard theory is these things are happening simultaneously. The subjective is happening, the feeling, the affect, and the physiology is, is, is working to deal with this emotional state. So, see the tiger, and this is mitigated through the thalamus, is what the idea was. So the thalamus is getting sensory information about this, and it's sending information over to the amygdala, unconscious, and telling the amygdala, hey, this, this scary thing's coming. Let's get the body ready to start running and doing whatever we need to do. But the thalamus is also sending an information to other parts of the brain saying, hey, there's a tiger here. We should be scared. You should have subjective feeling of scared. Ken and Bard said these things are happening simultaneously and not necessarily related to each other, causing the other. So now we get to the Schachner-Singer theory. Sometimes it's called the Schachter two-factor theory because it kind of rhymes. This theory is really about, yes, physiology is affecting the subjective sense of the emotion, just like James Lang said, but there's more to it. It's not like there's a fingerprint. It's about interpretation of physiological changes based on context. The emotional state, the subjective state, comes from the interpretation of the event. A quality of the emotion, emotional experience depends on appraisal, cognitive appraisal. So let's say you see a tiger. And your brain has to say, okay, what's going on here? My heart is racing. Yeah, I'm seeing a tiger. But why is my heart racing? I'm at the zoo. I Tigers are beautiful. I'm seeing this giant tiger for the first time. It's beautiful. My heart is racing. I must be feeling joy, happiness, because my heart is racing. Or maybe you see the tiger at the zoo and you're like, zoos suck, right? They keep animals in cages. I'm feeling angry by seeing this beautiful animal stuck in a cage. But I'm interpreting. My heart is racing, but I'm interpreting it. Affective experience comes from 
the interpretation. Or I'm walking along, minding my own business, and all of a sudden I come face to face with a tiger out in 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 the wild. I don't know what you why you saw, see a tiger in the wild, but whatever. Your brain goes, hey, that that's not behind a cage, and it's got big teeth. My interpretation of the racing heart is not happiness. It's not anger. It's fear. And so I will do something, but I will run away. Or I see it in the zoo, and I'm thrilled. And I'll stare at it, and oh, isn't that wonderful? Or I'm, and I feel happiness and joy. Or I'm, my heart is racing because I really don't like seeing that beautiful tiger in a cage. It's interpretation. Two factors. The physiology, yes. But the interpretation will, in, will then convert to the subjective sense of the emotion. And back and forth. So here's some evidence for the Shackner Singer theory, just a couple. Uh, a couple of examples. So Shackner and Singer brought some people into a lab, and they were uh, told that they are getting a shot of vitamin, right? And subjects were given adrenaline, but they thought it was a vitamin. Or another group was given a vitamin, and it was just a placebo, salt water, it was nothing. But adrenaline is going to give an arousal state increase, right? It's going to increase your heart rate. Now, the people weren't told that. They were told, oh, we're just giving you something. Okay, so then you have you separate the groups. You have the misinformed group. You give them some adrenaline. You say, this vitamin is going to relax you. It's going to decrease your heart rate. They're misinformed. Then you had some people who were given an adrenaline shot and said, this is a vitamin, but your heart is going to race because of it. It's going to elevate your heart rate. I'm just letting you know that this thing we're giving you is going to do this. And then you had a group that was told nothing. And then they were brought into another room. And in that room was what's called a research confederate, which means it seems like it's another research participant, but it's actually somebody who's part of the study. And if the people were put into the room, and the person that they're with is a jerk. They act like jerks. And they make the participant angry because they're jerks. Or they were brought into a room, another group, I guess we're splitting things up. Another uh, group of people brought into the room and there's a person there who's wonderful and nice and happy and joyful. And so this is what we found. The misinformed group tended to be subjectively happier in the happier room. In other words, they went into the room and they got a shot and the shot and they said, oh, this is gonna lower your heart rate. You go into the room and there's a happy person there. Your heart elevates and you say, ah, the reason my heart is elevating is because I'm around a happy person. That's the cause. You attribute the rising physiology to the circumstance. If you were put into the, um, if you're the misinformed group and you think that the adrenaline, the shot of adrenaline, they told them it was vitamins, and you go into the anger room, you're pissed off. You get angry. Why do you get angry? Well, because your heart is racing. Why is your heart racing? Because you're here in this room with a jerk. However, if you were told ahead of time, we're going to give you a shot of vitamins, it's going to raise your heart rate, you went in there, your heart raced, you're not that happy that in the happy room. Because you're interpreting, I know why my heart is racing. It's not because I'm with this happy person. It's not because I'm happy. It's because somebody gave me a shot and they told me what was going to happen. And, and when you're the angry person and you knew your heart was going to race because you were told it was going to happen, you're not as angry. And people who are not informed of anything about the kind of a injection that they were going to get, they were somewhere in between. Right, their heart raced and their they weren't really told whether it was going to decrease or increase their heart rate. So they were somewhere in between. So what they're doing is they're interpreting the change in their physiology, heart rate, based on what they know. I was given a shot, so I shouldn't change my emotions. I was told I was going to relax more and my heart is racing. It must be due to the circumstances, the happy people or the angry people. So this has a little to do with um, what Zillman called the excitation transfer theory, um, which is the fact that arousal states 
can transfer emotional states to other circumstances. Physiological arousal induced from one source influence the emotional experience in other. Right? So this is, uh, Zillman uh, connected this to Clark's drive theory and also the Shackner Singer theory. And uh, just as an example, you're watching a scary movie, you get all the physiology changes a whole bunch. You might have different interactions with your friends after the movie because you have this arousal state and it's transferred. So one of my favorite experiments that show this, this, this always makes me laugh a little bit, it's called the suspension bridge experiment. So here's how it works. An attractive woman is handing out a survey to men who had just crossed a bridge. She's on the other side. And the participants were asked to give an, uh, were given an ambiguous photo, a picture of somebody. There's somebody in the photo doing something. They're, si they're sitting down, they're over there playing a piano, whatever, they're a picture. And you say, tell me a story. Just, just make up a story about what you see in this. This is also known as the thematic apperception test. And the person would give a story. It's, oh, that person is sitting over there and they're going to go uh, walk outside and go down the street and get themselves a cheeseburger. What, they make stuff up. But when they do that in the thematic apperception test, people tend to look at the person in the picture and identify, say, oh, I'm that person in the picture. Right. And so I'm going to think about that person doing what I'm thinking about. Um, participants were told that also by the attractive woman that, hey, if you want to know the results of the experiment, give me a call. You can give me here's my phone number. Give me a call tomorrow and, and, I'll, and I'll let you know what we're finding. OK, now here's the difference. Um, it was handed out in the middle of a suspension bridge in one group. The ha handed out the, the survey and, and the thematic apperception test and the phone number, all that stuff, on a suspension bridge or on a solid, sturdy brick bridge. Okay? So imagine some guys walking across this bridge, way up above a gorge. It's swinging back and forth. And you walk across that, you're getting a little scared. It's a little exciting. A, a brick bridge, who cares? I don't have no fear. This thing isn't going to collapse. I'm not going to fall over the side. It's a little brick bridge. So you get this high arousal state on the suspension bridge and low arousal state on the brick bridge. And then at the end, the very end, there's the attractive woman. So we get what's called the misattribution of arousal. Okay? So the guys that are walking across the suspension bridge, is their heart is racing. And they're interpreting it, right? This is Shackner Singer. They're interpreting the racing heart. And when they meet the woman, they don't think to themselves, my heart is racing. This is probably at an unconscious level. My heart is racing because I just walked across a very scary bridge. Their heart is racing because they're looking at the woman and the, and the brain is interpreting. I think you find this person attractive, right? This is, uh, this is, a romantic arousal state interpreting the heart rate and for example when when we actually experience physiological responses related to fear people might mislabel those as romance uh, and that's what happened to these people so when the when the guys walked across the, the scary suspension bridge here's what they did um, they did the thematic apperception test they talked about the character in the picture and they tended to talk about kind of romantic things. Oh, that person in the picture, um, they're about to go on a date. <laughs> they're going to go, they're going to go out, out to a movie and then meet the person that they really like. And they're going to hold their hand. And right? They're, they're, because their heart is racing and they're looking at this attractive woman. They were also much more likely to call her in the coming days and say, hey, remember me on the bridge? Yeah, how's it going? Uh, hey, what were the results and what are you doing later? Kind of a thing. The people who crossed the, the guys who, who crossed the brick bridge, their heart's not racing. So they don't interpret the thematic apperception test as anything romantic. And they had a much less chance, uh, reduced chance of calling the participant the next day. Um, again, it's the arousal state. 
Uh, this is. I've watched some. I've read some books on this kind of stuff, and it's always always. There's a there's a really a good researcher in this area called Helen Fisher, and she's done some really interesting stuff. I talk about Helen Fisher in this class a bit, but she's like, if there's a romantic interest between two people, on the first date. Take them to a roller coaster, right? Get the heart racing because we're going to misattribute this. Now, there has to be an attraction to begin with. You can't induce attraction because of heart rate, but you can exacerbate it. If the heart rate is racing and you're looking at the person you're attracted to, the attraction is even higher. Okay. Here's another quick experiment I thought was kind of fun to talk about. Subjects ran in place for 15 to 120 seconds. They just elevated the heart rate. And then they were shown videos of university co-eds, other people, dressed attractive and energetic, these people that they looked at, or dressed unattractive and dull. Subjects were asked to rate the women's attractiveness. This, a lot of this research was done um, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and not a lot of this has been balanced for people um, with uh, same-sex attraction. I think that that's kind of that should be done, but I bet you get the same kind of results. It's just the kind of pictures you're going to show. But what you find is is that in the the people who are dressed nice, really nice and attractive, in the low arousal state, in other words, they were um, not running, their heart wasn't racing. They had, they rated them as being attractive, but if you bumped up their heart rate, they were rated as even more attractive. But it also, if you had low arousal state, the people who were dressed down and not attractive, they were rated as this attractive, but the heart rate increased that. I don't find that person attractive. My heart is racing. That exacerbated it. Kind of interesting. Romantic attraction. We see the same thing. In other words, increase arousal state by making them run, and they see the people who were dressed attractively as more attractive and those that were dressed down as less attractive. It exaggerated an emotional state. Okay. So now we get to some more contemporary theories. And this is a really interesting book by Lisa Feldman Barrett. It's called How Emotions Are Made. It's a good book. I've read the book. Uh, she has some good TED Talks. But she does not like the classical theory of emotions. Right? She, this, this violates all that. And she's, it's very controversial stuff she's, that she's doing. Uh, but she has some good reasons to do it. And her theory is called the, constructed, uh, the theory of constructed emotions. And these are some of her assumptions. Emotions are not easily compartmentalized and distinguishable. Right? We don't have these seven distinct characteristic emotions. There's a lot of, of in-between. They're not physiological fingerprints of emotions. And I, I tend to agree with her a little bit on this because I've done some work in this area. I can't tell if somebody's angry, happy, sad, frustrated in my lab by measuring their heart rate. I maybe can get a little bit of, hey, they, they feeling pretty good or they're feeling pretty bad. That's about it. So these ideas of very distinct facial expressions, this is all the stuff by Eichmann. She really doesn't like that stuff at all. Not to mention the fact that there's tremendous variation. And you've known people like this. I don't know about you, but maybe when you watch something funny on TV, you're emoting. You're smiling and you're laughing and you're just bouncing up and down and you think this is the greatest thing. And the person next to you also finds it extremely funny. But they don't express it in that way. They don't smile and laugh and giggle and roll over. They, their face might not move at all, but they're still feeling the emotion. Great deal of variation. So we don't have these fingerprints on, I can't tell, oh, that, that person's, I can tell by their face exactly how they're feeling. Because we, there's so much variability in how we express our emotions. So these ideas of fingerprints, and not to mention the fact that she reported results that I find in my own lab, that we, we can't put people, uh, attach electrodes all over somebody and tell, me, tell um, very clearly their emotional states, especially at the level of distinguishing different types of positive emotions, arousal, uh, 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 sexual arousal, romantic arousal, happiness, joy, 
you know, even fear and and sexual arousal, very similar emotional states, right? So emotions are constructed, she said, in the way we construct anything. We construct our sensory perceptions, we construct thinking, whatever, that we create them to deal with the situation at hand. And they these aren't necessarily innate. I'm not sure if I agree with her perfectly on the sort of genetic predispositions for emotional states, but she's saying that they they are constructed in anything else, in any way else we construct things. Um, and we don't have one part of the brain that says, oh, that's that's the fear center, and that's the happiness center, and oh, let's put a pin in that, and that's the disgust center, because that's a, that's a very classical theory of emotions idea that different parts of the brain are responsible for different emotions. She's saying the whole brain is involved in this thing, just like the whole brain is really involved with all aspects of higher cognition. Now, this is a really complicated theory, and I thought maybe we could just listen to a very short clip by uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett um, about how she's thinking about the constructed theory of emotion. So let's watch this very short clip and let, let's hear it in her own words. So constructed emotion is the idea that your emotions aren't given, they're not, um, it's not the case that you, that there's a ready-made circuit available in your brain and when it's triggered, you get this cascade, this suite of characteristic patterned responses. Um, instead, emotion, your brain makes emotion as it needs it on the spot using a set of all-purpose ingredients. So the same brain networks that make emotion also make thoughts and memories and perceptions. Um, and emotion is basically your brain's way of making sense of the sensory changes that are going on inside your body in relation to what's going on around you in the world. So an emotion is your brain making meaning of sensations from the world. It's not your reaction to the world, it's your construction of what the world is, what your body is like in the world as it appears to you in that moment. It's a complicated theory and, and her, her book is, is um a complicated theory and her book is really good she makes some very good points some points I agree with some points I don't but it's very hard to abandon old entrenched theories the classical theories of James Lang and Canon Baird and Shackner Singer uh, and she is trying to do that trying to rethink the ideas of emotions okay let's end this lecture by talking a little bit about moods and emotions what's the difference Moods tend to last longer, hours or days, versus a few seconds or minutes when it comes to emotions. Moods may be milder form of emotions. So I'm sad I'm versus I'm kind of gloomy, kind of melancholy, right? Moods come from stimuli that may occur over an extended period of time. So we're not running into the tiger, so to speak. Um, these might happen over the course of... Uh, slowly experiences of different events uh, and emotions have more of a sudden onset and moods tend to build slowly and end slowly they are very time dependent we tend to look at moods some interesting research on this um, which is basically giving somebody a phone app and every once in a while during the day at random times the phone app beeps you look down at the phone and says how you feeling right now and you type in your mood or it gives you some selections. And that way we can look at sort of a circadian, a time, circadian, the day event of your moods. And it may be affected by the um, time of the week, right? What's your mood like on Friday afternoon versus what's your mood like on Monday mornings? Uh, and of course, time of the year, right? So we'll talk about time of the year here in just a second. So this was a kind of an interesting study done back in 1999, and it, and it did just what I said. It, it didn't use phone apps, but it had this other way of asking people their emotional states and mood states during the day. And what you can see is that negative affect, feeling kind of crappy, is relatively consistent throughout the day. But positive affect is kind of lower in the morning, 
peaks in the afternoon and then begins dropping off as you get a little tired because that has a lot to do with our arousal state. But it's kind of interesting that it correlates with a physiological response, which is body temperature. It shows the same kind of thing. Okay, so let's think about time of the year. Um, we have what's called seasonal affective disorder. It's probably the best acronym of out there. It's SAD. Um, the DSM, the DSM-5 TR, uh, is a diagnostic tool manual for disorders. They have put this into major depressive disorder category. They call it major depressive disorder with seasonal pattern. I think co colloquially it's called seasonal affective disorder, but more clinically it's it's major depressive disorder with seasonal pattern. And what we see is that people's mood tends to be a little bit, have greater negative valence, it tends to be a little down during the winter. Uh, we call, sometimes call these winter blues. If somebody has depression, sometimes their depression symptoms are exacerbated during the winter months. Changes the way you eat, changes the way you sleep. You see a lot of the same kind of symptoms of depression. Uh, negative thoughts, ruminations, stuff like that. Tends to occur more the further people live from the equator. Why do you think that is? Right, it, it, it's because the further we are from the equator, the greater fluctuations we see in light, exposure to light. If you're in Fairbanks, Alaska in the winter, it's dark most of the day. You get a, maybe a few minutes of light, maybe a couple hours of light um, in some parts of the winter. Uh, of course, it's light all the time during the, the summer. If you're at the equator, you're not gonna see that shift much. So it happens more the further you are from the equator, right? It's like 9.2% uh, it occurs in Alaska. Uh, and the reason is, is that it's thought to disrupt our circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms are our daily patterns of sleep, arousal, eating, hormones that occur in a 24 hour cycle. And it's highly influenced by light. Their circadian rhythm is highly influenced by light. So therapy for this, typically antidepressants, people put on, you know, SSRIs or whatever, but also maybe it's just exposure to light might reduce some of these symptoms. Light therapy. People who are, are in dark a lot might get these full spectrum light next to their computer or even right into their eyes. Helps to reset their circadian rhythms and can, for some people, reduce the symptoms of seasonal affective disorder. So there's a part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus right here, which gets information from about light from the eye. It's right above the optic chiasm. That's why it's called suprachiasmatic nucleus. Gets a little information about the amount of light that you're experiencing. And the suprachiasmatic nucleus plays a big role in setting your body's 24-hour rhythm, your circadian rhythm of when you're hungry, when you're tired, when you're aroused, changes in temperature, changes in arousal, changes in hormone states, all those kinds of things. And this is going to be affecting, the, the suprachiasmatic nucleus is going to be interacting with what's called the pineal gland, which is back here, which has also a lot to do with... Um, uh, your circadian rhythm. It produces melanin, and melanin, which is a hormone, um, has been correlated with depressive symptoms, the levels of, of melanin. So lesions of the suprachiasmatic nucleus in, in rats or mice models, and they aren't they're not doing a normal 24-hour sleep and play on the wheel and eat. They're, it's all over the place. Um, so Trans, what's, one of the most interesting things is if you take the, the um, suprachiasmatic nucleus out of one animal, and there, there's variation, you can find some animals who don't live on a 24-hour cycle. They're living on a 28-hour cycle or 22-hour cycle because of the nature of variability. Take an animal that has a circadian rhythm of 22 hours and take it out and put it into another animal, kind of a weird little surgery there, and the second animal will take on those circadian rhythms of the first.
It's a little weird, okay? So here, here's the suprachiasmatic nucleus in humans, and here's the pineal gland, and they're intercommunicating, right? It has a lot to do with uh, melanin, right? Pine, pineal gland is producing melanin. Melanin is helping to promote sleep. It reduces jet lag. It's inhibited by light. Um, depresses body temperature. Again, light is affecting the brain and the, and the release of hormones and the release of activity, and that's going to mess with people's mood states. And if you're living in a place that you're not getting natural light during the winter, you're going to increase, for some people, symptoms of depression. Okay, that's kind of a long lecture, but I hope you learned a little bit about emotions and moods. Thank you.